Good morning. <coughs> We're going. We're going. Uh, I got as far as opening my notebook <laughs> this morning. <coughs> Uh, what's on my heart is kind of where I touched on towards the end of, of the last time I shared last the few Sundays ago when I when I had spoken and uh, I had I'd mentioned concerning Elijah and Elisha. And I touched on it a bit, but that still continues to be on my heart. In fact, if I can find it right here. The passage is found in 2 Kings chapter 2. And basically the <clears throat> at this point Elijah is about to be taken up and Elisha is going to remain. And at this moment of time, not only that is about to take place, but this whole time period is, a, is the time period right before Israel goes into captivity. It's, I mean, the Lord has been sending them prophets and uh, different ones to come speak to them. And it's right before Israel's about to go into captivity. And the reason why I mention that is because all the places, the, the places that are mentioned in this passage right here are very specific. I'll, I'll just give an example. Uh, verse, verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 2, And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Gilgal is very significant. It's very important. For one thing, it's, at least in my heart, one of the greatest places where the Lord shows a testimony of cutting away the first, cutting away the flesh, cutting away everything that bears the reproach of the first. This is what happened when... Uh, when Joshua, with that second generation, crossed the Jordan, they made, it, it says they made uh, flint knives or flint stone knives to cut, to circumcise, and it says it this way, to circumcise the children of Israel the second. And you can read that and you can just kind of pass by it, or you can read that and say, wait, whoa, whoa. This was the generation that was never circumcised while they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. The generation that was circumcised, that came out with Moses, who crossed the Red Sea, very significant, who crossed the Red Sea, they were circumcised. But the generation, the children that grew up in the wilderness were never circumcised. And yet in the scripture it says, they circumcised the children of Israel the second. And see, there's something, there's something great going on there. First of all, the Lord calls us unto himself. He does not, first and foremost, he calls us unto himself. He spoke this to Moses to speak it to the children of Israel 
when they came out of Egypt, when they passed through the Red Sea, he says, you saw what I did to the Egyptians. You saw the work, basically the work of my cross. And then he goes on to say this, and how that I bear you, I did this, I bear you on eagle's wings, which represents resurrection. But it's not just resurrection. I bear you on eagle's wings unto myself. Always unto a person. The, the high call of God, the above invitation of God, is found in the person of Christ Jesus. We are called unto a person, the person of Christ Jesus himself. And with the Red Sea, I'll just, I'll just use this. There's, there's not two crosses. There's one cross. There's the reality that Christ himself accomplished in the cross. And then there's this understanding, not of the cross, no, of the person. And this is what Jordan represents. They, in reality, when they came from death, from the children of Israel, from the abode of death, from the bondage of Satan, from being submitted to, in labor unto, in servitude unto, slaves unto, Egypt, Pharaoh, the abode of the dead, the Lord brought them out of that with the death of the Lamb. Because there were several plagues, but the plague that, or excuse me, the, the, the work that brought them out was the death of the Lamb, where they entered in through the door with the blood on the doorposts and lintel. Beautiful type of the cross. And yet, what is dead must be buried. And in that death of the Lamb, that they partook of, and now on the inside, they came into the house and partook, and now that very lamb is on the inside. With that, the condition of death was brought to death when they slew the lamb. That was just a testimony. Paul, Paul said it this way, uh, for the love of Christ constrains us, therefore we this judge. We make this judgment that if one died for all, all died. All were made to be dead. In fact, that is the exact confession of the Egyptians. You know, send them forth from here, get them out of here, for we be dead men. That was their own confession. And so what's the condition that's brought to death must be buried because it is of God the burial. It, uh, Abraham said it this way when Sarah died. He said, let me buy a parcel of land to bury the dead out of my sight. This is what God does. This is what God does. So with that, which back to, sorry, back to um, Moses and Israel having slain the lamb, there's the death. Now there's the burial and the burial is the Red Sea where all of Israel comes in, not only Israel, all of Egypt comes in as well, but only one comes forth out of the grave. Israel is my son, even my firstborn. In type, in testimony, the son only comes out of the grave. Everything else is left buried. All of the first came to an end, and it not only came to an end, it was buried out of God's sight. He only sees him who remains, his son. He only sees the one life that is there, his son. So this whole generation is in the wilderness. And of course, they were disobedient unto the testimony. They were disobedient unto the Lord. They don't go in and uh, possess the land. So the Lord said, okay, that generation, you'll, you'll stay, you'll wander 40 years, and you'll die in the desert. And First of all, the Lord just didn't discount them and say, okay, forget you. No, no. While they were in the wilderness, God time and time and time again gave them testimony of his son. With everything, there's a testimony of Christ, whether they saw it or not, whether they realized it or not. Because remember, the Lord doesn't call to a quote-unquote location. He calls unto his son. 
always. First in reality, he does this by his own mercy because man could not do it. Man could not do it. Moses, in his strength, couldn't deliver the children of Israel while they were among the dead. Moses, in his strength, couldn't even deliver himself. The Lord. The Lord brings it about. The Lord brings it about in reality. For us, that is the moment of new birth. See, whether we realize it or not, all this happens at the moment of new birth. Translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That happens the moment of new birth. And yet, there is this Jordan that must be crossed. There is this coming to the Gilgal where the cutting away of the first where the cutting away of the reproach of the first is taken away. Not from God's eyes, because it has been taken away from God's eyes when the Lamb was slain. The moment we entered into that door, the moment we, for us who are born again, that very moment we were born again, all death, that condition of death, the condition of abode among the dead, the burial, all that happens like in an instant. All God sees is His Son. For the born-again believer, we may see, who knows what we may see. And see, that was the issue. They, the children of Israel, were in the wilderness. Pharaoh was not present. He wasn't there. His, he wasn't there. His armies wasn't there. His rule wasn't there. His dominion wasn't there. It was all destroyed in the death of the Lamb. And it was all buried at the Red Sea, the burial. Nothing of Pharaoh, nothing of the first, crossed over, came over. And yet you have the children of Israel in the wilderness saying, oh, if we had just stayed in Egypt, the leeks, the onions, the melons, it was better off, we were better off over there. Pharaoh's not present, his kingdom's not present, his dominion is not present. They are, in type, the children of Israel, in resurrection. The king is present. His kingdom is ruling and reigning because now they have life. Before there was no life among the dead in Egypt, no life whatsoever. Now they have life, whether they recognize it or not. Now the king is present, therefore the kingdom is present, ruling and reigning, governing, yes. And yet the children of Israel see something different. This is the Jordan. This is the Jordan. I, um, I wanted to read this, <coughs> excuse me, this little statement here. This is from, uh, just because I was reading it, it's like, whoa, it blew me away. This is from Stephen's New Testament Greek grammar. And um, it is the New Testament Greek second edition by Gerald L. Stevens. This is something in this preface, this preface. It says, uh, I guess the reason why he, he did a second edition from the first. First, because I thought I could build a better mousetrap. I don't know how that related, but it goes on. And this is, he, he, he goes on to add more tables, generous graphics, and greater point sizes. This is all like improvements in the second edition of, of, of this book. And it's basically for learning Greek grammar in, um, in colleges and Bible colleges and Bible universities, Bible schools. And then he goes on to say this, how can we learn what we cannot see? How can we learn what we cannot see? This is a scholar. I'm quoting him. This is a scholar. This is a Greek scholar. This is a Greek teacher. He teaches Greek. How can we learn what we cannot see?
the children of Israel while they walked in the wilderness. They did not see him who was present among them in the midst. They didn't see him. What they had before their eyes was Pharaoh and Egypt. Did that change their condition? No, it did not. Did that change their situation? No, it did not. Nothing of reality, nothing of the truth was changed. And yet their daily goings about were rough because they saw not who was present. And because seeing not who was present, they knew not him who truly is their life. They just kept thinking, this over here is my life. Therefore, they go towards what they believe to be their life, regardless of the truth. Remember, in God's sight, that I may bury my dead out of my sight, God sees the one who remains his son. The children of Israel and the Lord continually time and time again showing them in their midst to see the testimony of his son. Example, the rock that was smitten. Well, we saw this great rock that Moses went and struck and we had water, we drank to the full. And the Lord is saying, this is my son for whoever hungers and thirsts. And they, they just saw a rock. The manna. Oh, well, we were fed with this whatever it is. What is it? The what is it? We were fed by the by the I don't know. To them, the I don't know sustained them <laughs> their whole entire existence. The I am whom you do not know sustained them, whether they knew him or not, whether they realized it or not. And then later on, Jesus says, I am that bread from heaven. Time and time and time again, that we would see and that they would see the one who was present in the midst. They were led 40 years. They were led. They were led by the cloud by day, and a fire by night. They were led by the glory of God because that is what it represented, the glory of God that is found exclusively in the face of Jesus Christ and nowhere else. But who saw this glory? Who saw this one? Therefore, who knew this one? We know Moses did. I mean, his own face shown that the children of Israel said, put a veil over it. <laughs> Moses saw, Joshua saw as well, because Joshua, Joshua remained. Even after Moses had gone to the people, Joshua remained. Gilgal, Gilgal. That they went, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. This is where they began. They began in reality. They began in the land. Gilgal is in the land, part of the kingdom of, uh, of Israel. I can show you the map, but you, I'm not sure how good your vision is. I wouldn't be able to see it from the first row. I mean, mine, my glasses are so scratchy. They began in the kingdom of Israel. They began in the land. They began on this side of Jordan. Elijah is walking in this reality. He is. And it's not because Elijah said, well, I recognized 
in the scriptures the temple or the, the tabernacle. I recognized in the scriptures the rock with the water. I recognized in the scriptures the manna. I recognized in the scriptures the cloud by day and the fire by night. I recognized in the scriptures, no, no, no. That's not why he was walking in truth, walking in reality. See, his heart was actually submitted unto the truth. Elijah's heart was submitted. Remember, the children of Israel, 40 years in the wilderness, in reality, they are in type in resurrection. In reality, the Lord himself is in the midst. But the kingdom, and, and yes, the kingdom of God is present. Remember, Pharaoh's not there. He's not there. He's nowhere to be found there. He's left dead and buried, out of sight. The kingdom of darkness, the kingdom of this age, the kingdom of the world, the kingdom of of the abode of the dead is not present. The kingdom of God is present because the king is present. The kingdom of the son of his love. Life rules and reigns and governs. Whose heart is submitted unto the truth. That's it. With with Elijah and Elisha, Elijah's heart is submitted unto the truth. Elijah didn't have to do anything to be in the kingdom of Israel. Well, in testimony, he would have to be born again, which, you know what? When Elijah was born, he was probably born in Israel. Elisha, what did he have to do? He probably just had to be born. Already in the kingdom, once you're born, The Apostle Paul really touched on this. I think it was, yeah, when, it, I'm not sure if it was in Rome or in some different place, but they, they came and they, they arrested him. And there was a centurion who was speaking to him. And this is after they beat him quite a, you know, quite a bit. And the, Paul turns to the centurion and he says this, is it lawful to beat a Roman citizen? And see, it's not. To beat a Roman citizen is penalty of death. So when a Roman citizen or a Roman soldier said, hey, you, carry my bags, yes, sir. You know, it was a side note. So here's Paul, is it lawful, speaking to a centurion, one in authority. Is it lawful to beat a Roman citizen? Of course, the centurion was afraid. He's, well, he says, uh, with much money, I bought my freedom. This cost me something to, quote unquote, become a Roman citizen. To have citizenship cost me money. And the Apostle Paul says, I was born by nothing that I did, by none of my effort whatsoever. The moment of new birth, we are born citizens. We are born into the kingdom. It is not our doing. It is God's very own doing. It is his work and is marvelous. Who can glory in what they've not done? No one, no one. We can only glory in our Lord. They began in the kingdom. Their journey also, this short journey right here, began in the kingdom as well. Elijah's heart was submitted unto the truth. And it wasn't because Elijah, as I stated, recognized this or that or did this or did that. But it's, it's found in, I think, two different places where Elijah states it. Uh, I think the very first time, I'll just look this up real quick.
in, I think it's 1 Kings, the very first appearance of Elijah. Yes, the very first appearance of Elijah. The very first mention of his name, the very first time he quote unquote shows up on the scene. 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. And Elijah the Tishbite, the, the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab. Now I'd have to look up Gilead to just to double check and make sure that, what, that it was in the land. But um, I won't do that right now. Said unto, Ab uh, unto Ahab, Ahab the king at the time, uh, that was definitely not following the Lord, heart submitted unto something less, said unto Ahab, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, the very first rattle out of the box, as the Lord God of Israel liveth, there is one who lives. He goes on, before whom I stand. And it's not just before whom I stand, it's more specific if you look at the word before, before whose face I remain. Before the one I see. So right here, with the journey, the short journey of Elijah and Elisha, Elijah's heart is submitted unto the truth. Elijah's heart is submitted unto the Lord who liveth. He beholds the only one who lives. And you, you, can, you can go on and see that, that, I don't want to say it this way because it'll sound weird, but Elijah, he's out there. A better way to put it is this. Elijah's heart has been brought forth abroad from all of this that we see with a natural realm. His heart has, brought been, has been brought forth abroad from this unto where in testimony and in type, his soul has been brought in reality. Remember, children of Israel, you saw what I did to the Egyptians and how I brought you upon eagles' wings unto myself. But what is the heart submitted unto? Submitted unto that which is seen in the natural or submitted unto the truth, beholding unto myself, beholding him unto whom we have been brought. And so this, this right here with Elijah and Elisha, I, I, I love it. Each one of these places means so much. Bethel, the house of God. That's what Jacob said. Surely the Lord is, not was, not will be. Surely the Lord is in this place. I knew it not until I saw. And then he confessed, this is the house of God. At this particular time uh, in the history of Israel, who knows what Gilgal, Gilgal had become. I know that Bethel, uh, from the house of God, man got a hold of it, and now it's the house of the two calves that were worshipped. I think it was Manasseh, no, uh, some king set them up there, two calves for Israel to worship, so they wouldn't have to go all the way to, to Jerusalem. No, just worship here, just stay here, because he wanted to... The king at the time, he wanted to, Manassas maybe, he wanted to control, he wanted to govern as opposed to the Lord governing. Oh, you don't have to go all the way to Jerusalem. No, I'll set up these two calves, you can worship them here. That's what Beth Bethel had become. <clears throat> and in each place, Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, all in the land, all in the kingdom, and all very significant. And each place with, with, that they come to, I'll just, uh, here, set back to 2 Kings chapter 2, starting with verse 1. And it came to pass when the Lord would take up Elijah into heaven by whirlwind that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. 
And Elijah said unto Elisha, Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me to Bethel. And Elisha said, As the Lord liveth. See, things are rubbing off on Elisha. As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they went down to Bethel. They went from Gilgal to Bethel. Oh, but remember what an understanding there is at, with Gilgal, the cutting away of the first, the taking away of the first, the, re, the taking away of the reproach of the first. An excellent teaching, an excellent message. We could even call it an excellent deeper life message. The Lord has called us unto a person. God himself, the heavenly calling, the above invitation has been unto a person and continues to be unto a person and will always be unto a person. Nothing less than a person. Nothing less than a person. And see, though man is not faithful unto the testimony, though man is not faithful unto the truth, though man is not faithful unto purpose, the purpose for which God created the soul, God alone remains faithful. So there you have why a believer will begin any particular fellowship or whatever, and there's just something going on in them, and they begin to, because I even experienced this, they begin to, there's got to be something more. There's, there's got to be, I've done, okay, I've done this, I've, you know, I've jumped through the hoops, I've done it all. I've, I've, I've done all that we're talking about. I've done it, been there, done that. But I didn't get the t-shirt. There's got to be something more. And that question, there has to be something more, comes from the Holy Spirit preparing the ground of our heart for the more. Now, it's not the for the more that he's going to give us. No, no. The more is the seeing, the knowing him whom God hath already given us. What more of Jesus will you possibly ever get? No. You have received everything you will ever receive of God in the person of Christ at the moment of new birth. The question is, have we seen him whom we received or not? And that's why the Holy Spirit remains faithful, dealing with our heart. More, unto the more, unto the more, unto the more. And see, we always latch on to a teaching. We, we, less, we, we, we latch on to a teaching, we latch on to a message, because it's the first thing that comes to these natural ears, and it's the first thing that we can understand with our natural brain. Even with the, testimony, the types and testimonies, oh yeah, I, 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 oh yeah, I get that now. I got it. I mean, I, I heard it, and I searched it out. Oh yeah, you know, what they were saying was true. Yes, you know, the water gushing forth from the rock. Yes, that is a testimony of Christ. I've seen the testimony. Praise God. Hallelujah. And yet that testimony is purposed of God, designed of God to have its perfect work in our heart, to direct our heart unto the substance of the testimony, unto a person. Because we are not called unto a message. We are not called unto a doctrine. We are not called to a, unto a teaching. We are not called unto a deeper life teaching. We are not called to a study or a sermon or anything like that. We are called unto a person. And God the Father is the only one faithful unto his Son. And so the Holy Spirit remains faithful to prepare the ground of our heart, that our heart, by the work of the Spirit, may be directed unto this very Son. Time and time and time again, in every generation the call goes forth. In every generation, God calls, 
God calls in every generation. And by the Spirit of God, we respond. Remember the last time that I was sharing? What can, how, how can a dead person respond to anything living? Impossible. It requires a miracle of God. It requires mercy of God to do that which is completely and utterly impossible to do with man, but God and God alone is possible to accomplish it. God calls and God brings unto a person. God's call does not change. See, you remember? Children of Israel in Egypt, God's call does not change. Bring you unto a land flowing with milk and honey. It doesn't change. And by the way, that whole bring you unto a land filled with milk and honey, it's the same call, except, you know, a few words added, that Abram was called with. Get thee out of thy land, from thy kindred, unto a land that I will show thee. And remember the whole significance with Abraham was that the Lord brought him and when Abraham finally came to the land by God's leading, by God's doing, in God's mercy, what does Abraham discover in the land? And the Lord appeared. And Abraham continued discovering the Lord who was ever present in the land. <clears throat> so the call of God goes forth. And God, he doesn't, he is not Pharaoh. He is not some taskmaster with a whip. No, that's what, that's what you experience before you're born again. That is your existence before you are born again. Slavery, bondage, taskmasters. That's before you are born again. Our God is not a taskmaster. He's a gentleman. I, I love the way uh, the Holy Spirit's represented by a dove. You know, if, if, even, even if, if, if you see a dove, if, if you're making a lot of noise, it's just going to fly away. The call is unto a person every time. And though we may learn things along the way, though we may discover the testimony of this one, it's only there to direct our heart unto the person that we may discover the person anew, time and time and time again. I told some of the students the other day, what do you think my wife would say after I married her and said, well, I've seen you so long till we meet again. This is what I did. I said, Pah. no, <laughs> that's our thinking. No. When you're joined to a person, you want to be joined to that person. I mean, when, 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 a, when a couple gets married, it's because they want to be together, listen, for the rest of their life. At the moment of new birth, we have been joined unto our husband, the Lord himself, for the rest of, throughout all eternity. I mean, even after we put off these clay vessels, we're still joined unto the Lord. And a beautiful example with, I guess, the marriage type is that it's, it is the husband who removes the veil from off of his wife. No man doeth this. No man but the Lord. 
But see, he does this so that we may see him. The one we have been joined to. Us who are born again since the moment of new birth. And the call goes forth in every generation. And though man may settle with, quote unquote, a move of God, God is only settled with his son. Yes, at the moment of new birth, you have been brought onto everything God ever desired to bring your soul into. He also desires for us to know him unto whom he has brought our soul. Elijah and Elisha. The Lord hath called me on. You stay here. No, no. As the Lord liveth and thy soul liveth, I will not leave you. The understanding, the doctrine, the message, the teaching, that's fine. But that serves a purpose. To prepare the ground of my heart, to direct it unto a person. I will not leave you. In every generation. And so they go on to Bethel. The same thing. Where does it say it? Uh, in verse 3, And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha. I mean, the sons of the prophets. These were men of God standing for the truth in their generation. While all were saying, Bethel, the house of the two calves, the golden calves. These are standing and saying, no, Bethel is the house of God, people. Open your eyes. The Lord is in his temple. Standing for the truth. The sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest that the Lord will take thy master from thy head today? They even knew what was going on. They even knew the signs of the times. And he said, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. Yeah. I know. I know, I, I know the signs of the times as well. And Elisha said unto Elisha, Terry here, verse 4, I pray thee, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. And he said, as the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. So they came to Jericho. The signs of the times? The events? So? I'm after a person. Because events will come and events will go. But will my heart be submitted unto knowing this person or not? And to know this person cannot be known, listen, by the signs of the times, cannot be known by events, cannot be known by the natural eyes, and cannot be understood by the natural brain. Jesus said, you know, some will come, you know, saying, hey, lo, there, Christ, or hey, over here, Christ. Jesus, Jesus himself says, don't go after them. For the kingdom of God is within you. You can't see it by what's on the outside. That's what the Jews, the Pharisees, the Sadducees were looking for. Nicodemus, a Jew, Nicodemus, yeah, Nicodemus, member of the Sanhedrin, Sanhedrin 70, I think. Well, if I'm wrong, sorry. Member of the Sanhedrin, nonetheless, a Jew. And he comes to Jesus by night and says, look, we know the signs of the times. No man can do what you're doing except God be with him. This has got to be the kingdom of God. Jesus' response is, no man can see the kingdom except he be born again. What you see outwardly is not the kingdom.
and I love this. I remember the first time Rabin shared this. It was a very long time ago, at least the first time I heard it. Because there's purpose to new birth. No man can see the kingdom except he be born again. There is purpose for new birth to see the kingdom. To see the kingdom is to see the king. All Israel, all the Jews, they were awaiting the Messiah, the king of Israel, to liberate them from the rule of the Romans. They wanted a physical, natural deliverance. And yet, the deliverance that God brings is so much greater. How I brought you on eagle's wings unto myself. They had been delivered 40 years. They had been delivered from the kingdom of darkness, translated into the kingdom of the son of, their lo uh, the son of his love. But the hearts did not see the king who was present. And yet the Lord remains faithful. God is faithful unto his son. And I, I, I love this because man isn't. I mean, what, what <laughs> we don't have to put on a front. I mean, we're flakes. I mean, if, if we don't think we're flakes, compare yourself to God. Okay, we're flakes. You know, you, if we want to compare ourselves between each other, why, well, if we like comparing ourselves, why don't we compare ourselves unto, once again, the Almighty, El Shaddai, the one who created everything, the all-powerful. Even Job, I have heard of thee by the hearing of the ear. And now my eyes see thee, and I abhor myself. If we like comparing, it's a good comparison. Elijah and Elisha. And this is each one of us. Every single, whether you're born again or not, and I love that. Because the gospel isn't just for these or for these. No, the gospel is for the soul of man across the board. Christ himself, the purpose for which the soul was created, the Son for which the, poor, the, the soul was created. But now us who are born again, who have been brought by the ability and power of another unto him, um, unto him to whom we could never have come on our own. And the Holy Spirit remains faithful to prepare the ground of our heart to direct our heart unto this one, time and time and time again. And you see it right here. The Lord has called me on. You can stay here. See, that's like, that's like I love this. It's like a spirit of God. I'm going on in purpose. You can stay here with whatever you have found. Because Elijah is leading Elisha by the mind and will of God, the Lord hath called me on. The Lord hath, what, how does he say it? Tarry here, I pray thee, for the Lord hath sent me, being led by God himself. But you can stay here if you want. Here where you have found comfort for a time and season. Here where you have found this message to sustain you for a time and season. Maybe you found natural manna, and that sustained you for a time and season. But the Lord has called me on unto substance. And see, that was the thing with, with Abraham that Abraham experienced. See, he experienced, first of all, at one point, he had to, well, it was by the ability of God, because he couldn't otherwise. But at some juncture with Abraham, he had to cast out the bondwoman and her child. Cast out the first, the first, yeah, the first, that which is, that which is never submitted unto the house, unto what governs the house of God. That was a tough decision. Okay, let go of what I believe, let go of what I believe to be what it's all about. Hmm, that's a tough one. For Isaac, right? 
And yet the Lord had prepared his heart to where it is no longer Abraham's ability, but the Lord's ability in Abraham. Therefore, Ishmael and Hagar are out of the picture. The reproach of Egypt? Yes, the reproach of Egypt. Hagar, Hagar was an Egyptian. <laughs> the reproach of Egypt was buried out of his sight now. And all that remains is this Isaac, one who was born in the land, the one whom God himself had promised. And yet at this other juncture, because Isaac is, remember, a testimony of Christ. Isaac's not Christ. Isaac is a testimony of Christ. And yet at this other juncture, here's the Lord. Once again, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, and offer him up unto me. Whoa! Another dealing of the Lord. Now to go from the first dealing, major, I guess, one of the dealings like these, Abraham had gone from the first unto the second, from that which is not the testimony of Christ unto the testimony of Christ. That requires a miracle of God. It requires a miracle of God to take your eyes off of you and place them upon the testimony of his son. That requires a miracle of God. You can't do that. I can't do that. That's like reading the Bible. I remember when it happened to me, I was like reading the Bible. It's like, oh my God. I've got my Bible on this thing. Oh my God, Jesus is in here. He was there the whole time. I never knew it. God did. It's perfect testimony of his son. That's a miracle of God. But God does not call us unto a testimony, even a perfect testimony. God calls the soul unto a person, his son, a person, the real deal. Other example. My wife would not be happy with me if all I did was carry her picture around and say that is sufficient enough for me. Maybe it would be sufficient enough for me. It wouldn't be for her. <laughs> well, I've got your picture. It's all good. No, it's not. That picture is to remind you of me that I'm here. I'm here. So now this other dealing with Abraham. He's holding on to Isaac. This is it. This is it. This is it. I finally, God led me here. He gave me the ability to let go of what I thought. It was all about, and now here, I've got it. I'm holding on to it. Oh, I'm not letting go of this one. And the Lord comes and says, Take now thy son, thine only Isaac. Offer him up unto me in the place where I tell thee. Or maybe it's the place that I show thee. And so what's going on in his heart? He, he may not have known what was going on, but the Lord had been preparing his heart that whole entire time. Whether, whether we realize it or not, the Lord is preparing our heart by the work of his spirit. This is what he is doing. Prepares our heart unto a person. The real person. So here's Abraham. And I love, I, I, Hebrews maybe? And Abraham, full of faith, by the ability of God, not by his own ability whatsoever. He says, okay, I'll let him go. Knowing that God would raise him up again. Abraham's heart directed from the testimony unto the person. It is a leap of faith in every instance. One which only God and God alone can work in us. Because once again, it is Him working to will and to do for 
his good pleasure, his good pleasure, and his son is his good pleasure. Elijah and Elisha. Elijah is continuing on. Will you, Elisha? You can stay here. This, the, the, these, they're standing in the midst of everything gone awry, seemingly, and they're standing for the truth. You can stay here. The Lord has sent me on. I completely believe that Elisha's heart had been prepared by God to be able to even confess what he did. The Lord liveth, thy soul liveth. I will not leave thee. And he continues on following. And so it goes on. Uh, and then get this. They go from Gilgal to Bethel to Jericho. Actually, for you guys, it would be Bill, uh, Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, and then like, yeah, Jordan's right here. And then they cross Jordan. Yeah, like Eli we, we know the story. Elijah goes, takes his mantle. Wow, 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 wow. The waters are parted. The exact same way the waters were parted when Joshua and Israel walked through. The same way the waters were parted at the Red Sea. Very significant. Reality, the knowledge of reality. So in, you can think, oh, well, they just stepped out of the land. Nope. That's the kingdom of Israel as well. They never left the kingdom. Well, I've got it on the map. You can see here. Pull it up on any Bible map software or online or whatever, even maybe at the back of your physical Bible under maps. They started in the kingdom of Israel. They crossed Jordan. They were still in the kingdom of Israel. And now Elijah is taken up. Well, before that, it says this. Uh, let's see if we can find it. Where is it? And I love this. Yeah, I love the way it's. Yeah. Second Kings chapter two verse nine. And it came to pass when they were gone over across the Jordan, that Elisha said, Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee. Ask me anything. Before I be taken from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of, my, of thy spirit be upon me. First and foremost, the double portion goes to the firstborn. Elisha is not saying, I want to be the firstborn. That's not what he is saying. The double portion goes to the firstborn, the firstborn who is Christ himself. What he is saying is the understanding that your heart is submitted to, the kingdom, the reality, the government, the rule, the reign, the truth, the light, the one whom your heart is submitted to, may mine be submitted to as well. What governs your heart and what your heart is submitted to, the government that your heart is submitted to, may my heart as well be submitted unto such a kingdom. This is what he's saying. This is, this is what he's saying. Verse 10, And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. You asked for the impossible, what is impossible with man. Your desire is to go on, is to continue, and it's impossible with man. You can't do it. I can't do it for you. I love that. I mean, it's, he's, he's not being arrogant. Oh, yeah, I can do it. Hold on there. No, 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 no. No. With man, it is impossible for new birth. With man, it is impossible for the knowledge of new birth. I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, thou hast asked a hard thing. 
Nevertheless, if you see me, when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And so, it's not just if you see me, because he was looking at him, right? The whole time. He, I mean, he was following him. He even spoke to him. I, I doubt that he would speak to his back. He spoke to him face to face. He says, if you see, if you see me. When I am taken from thee. We all know he was taken in type in resurrection, right? Okay, and it came to pass as they went, this is uh, 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 11. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire. Chariot and horses of fire. Big ball of fire. And parted them both asunder and Elijah went up by a whirlwind, not by the chariot, by a whirlwind into heaven. In type, Elisha saw the resurrection. Yes. In type, in testimony, Elisha saw the resurrection. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. How he had known Elijah, Eli, how Elisha had known Elijah after the flesh, after the seeing of the natural eye, after the hearing of the natural ear, after the understanding with the natural brain. He saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes, this is Elisha, and rent them in two pieces. You say, I'm completely undone. I abhor myself. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that had fallen, that fell from him, and went back and stood by the bank of the Jordan. And here's where it is. Remember? The Red Sea crossing, reality. Jordan, the understanding of reality. The understanding of the truth. It is when our hearts are submitted unto the truth. Our hearts submitted unto the kingdom of God that is present. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? Because that, that is a question that the Spirit of God brings us to. The Spirit of God bringing the whole entire time, our heart, where are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? And when he had also, also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. It's as though Elisha could have confessed, he is in me. And my heart is submitted unto the truth now. My heart is submitted unto the king now, unto the kingdom that is present. And you find all these things going on with Elisha. I mean, look, look at this, even, I mean, he could very well say, it is not my mind, but the mind of the Lord in me. Not my words, but the words of, word of the Lord in me. From this moment onward. And when the sons of the prophets, which uh, were 
which went to view at Jericho saw him, they said, the spirit of Elijah doth rest upon Elisha. It is not I, but another. He could finally confess this. And you find in two different places that I know of, there may be more, but I know for a fact two different places, Elisha begins declaring, the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand. Finally, his heart had been brought unto the person, the very one whom his soul had been brought the moment he was born. This is the call in every generation throughout all eternity. The call is unto a person, Christ Jesus, the one and only beloved Son. We are not called to anything you can see with a natural ear, anything you can hear with the, excuse me, anything you can see with the natural eye, or anything you can hear with a natural ear. We are called unto a person. And though we may let up and settle for something less, Gilgal, Bethel, Jericho, some understanding, oh, well, this is good, this will carry me, this will sustain me. This is good, this is good manna. The Spirit of God remains faithful because God the Father remains faithful unto His Son to bring us from what we call good and sustainable that our hearts may be directed unto the only one who is good and who sustains and listen, hath sustained in reality since the moment of new birth. We're not getting anything more. The Lord just desires to show what, him whom we have received. This is the call time and time and time again in every generation. And the Spirit of God prepares the ground of our hearts for such a call and for such a response. So that's all I had for this morning. Please take it, present it to God, let him do what he wants to do because he's God. What no man can do and may the Lord do what he does best, I guess. Amen. Thank you for this time.